So thank you, thank you once again, everybody, for coming. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, one, one quick item about Angelo is that even in his old age, and that's the time when I knew him, uh, he had the vitality of a young man. Uh, it was really a remarkable thing to see. Uh, never shriveled in spirit, uh, obviously not in body until the very last days. And it was one of the great joys uh, to be, you know, a young man in his company because of his constant willingness to talk. Uh, and uh, uh, seeing him reflect and be joyful in conversation about the most serious topics, uh, while also never having uh, a kind of self-protection that often older people have with younger people when they're trying to uh, pretend to know more than they do. Uh, you never saw that. There was this honesty and this real uh, uh, vital mind, uh, a desire to talk uh, and reason about things. Uh, and that's partly one of the reasons that there are so many of these uh, legendary stories about him uh, that are both hilarious and often insightful. Uh, I'll give you just one from uh, a personal conversation that I had with him uh, l much later in life, maybe three, four years before um, he passed away. We were talking about uh, plans that the Soviet Union had made to effect a communist revolution in India. And the plan was basically something like the following, that uh, they would use journalists to uh, promise the beauties of communism uh, these would be journalists that were genuine believers. Then the problem would be that once the revolution took place, these journalists would become your enemies because they were the most disillusioned by what took place. And so the Soviet plan called for getting rid of them. And when I said this to Angelo, he kind of smiled uh, and immediately reacted and said something like, this is why the Soviet Union was dumb. They were too heavy-handed. All you had to do was pay them off. <laughs> uh, one more very short story uh, that, that shows his legendary status. Uh, Ryan Williams alluded to this. We had a Lincoln Fellow uh, not long ago, a couple of years ago, uh, who lived in Manassas and who had a lot of neighbors that worked in our intelligence apparatus. And when he proudly declared to them, to these neighbors, these friends, that he was coming to California to be a Lincoln Fellow for the summer. Uh, they asked if Angelo would be teaching. He said yes, and they asked to pass along a message to him from them, which was, F you. Uh, so two generations of hatred uh, from the Intel state, uh, it's quite, uh, it really is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a funny little anecdote to tell, but it, it, is, it is really remarkable that they knew precisely who he was long after he was you know, out of official practice and marked him out uh, as an enemy, presumably because uh, it stung what he had to say. Uh, he, for, many, uh, for several generations, was among the very few people, uh, the lone voice in the wilderness, uh, that understood how that intel state operated and uh, has ended up being much more prescient than almost uh, anyone else, uh, obviously including the worshipers uh, of that intel state. And so we have a wonderful panel today uh, who are competent to talk about his foreign policy views, his views on the intel state. First will be David Goldman, my colleague, uh, who is a Washington fellow at the Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life, which is uh, the Claremont Institute's branch in DC that I run. Uh, he is uh, also the deputy editor of the Asia Times, where he's written the Spengler column since 2001. He has a long history working in finance, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, uh, Bear Stearns. He's the author of several books. Most recently, uh, You Will Be Assimilated, China's Plan to Sinoform the World. Next will be Brian Kennedy, uh, also one of my colleagues. Uh, he, for many years, was the president of the Claremont Institute. He's now a senior fellow. He's a member of our board. Uh, he currently is the chairman of the Committee on the Present Danger, China, which he founded in 2019. He's also the president of the American Strategy Group. He frequently appears on Bill Bennett's show, on Steve Bannon's show, uh, and he has written in a variety of publications, including, I should add, uh, a, book by encounter, a book by Encounter Books called Communist China's War Inside America. 
Last, we have Mike Waller, who is Senior Analyst for Strategy at the Center for Security Policy, where he concentrates on propaganda, political warfare, psychological warfare, and subversion. I hope that my bio can say something like that one day. Um, <laughs> very nice. Uh, he's formerly a professor of international communications at the Institute of World Politics, and formerly an instructor, an instructor at the Naval Postgraduate School and at Fort Bragg. He's the author or editor of books relating to intelligence, political warfare, public diplomacy, terrorism, and subversion. Uh, please welcome our panel, David Goldman. Please. Thank you. Um, uh, Arthur, thank you for that kind introduction, and what an honor it is to honor Angela Cotavilla. My subject today is how Angelo Cotavilla saved the world and how we should emulate him by saving the world once again. Uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration because Angelo Cotavilla didn't save the world single-handed. He was one of a tiny number of people who won the Cold War against all odds and against enormous opposition. Um, I can say fairly, though, although I didn't meet Angelo until about 10 years ago, I was his disciple since 1982, when he was one of the key leaders of the campaign to bring about strategic defense initiative, the key concept that won the Cold War. For those of you who have graduate students, I'd like to point out that in the Edward Teller archives, there's a box of correspondence with uh, Angelo marked 1962 to 1985. So Angela was deeply involved with the scientific issues which led to strategic defense initiative with the great scientist who personally persuaded governor, then Governor Reagan and later President Reagan to go with the strategic defense initiative against the overwhelming opposition of the military and in fact most of the scientific establishment. Angelo, among other things, was a scientist. His undergraduate training was in physics. The last time I saw Angelo before his sad death, we had dinner with uh, Bob Riley in Washington, and he expounded in enormous technical detail on the aspects of strategic defense initiative which had been shelved after the collapse of communism in 1990 uh, and argued for their revival, space-based missile defense, given the threat that we currently have from China and North Korea. Uh, he could not have done this without scientific training. And one of the things that strikes me about him as a Renaissance man and universal mind is that it's very difficult to find anyone with that breadth of intellect today, and certainly difficult to train anyone with that range of command of history, politics, foreign and domestic policy, as well as science. The great split in Western culture between science, psychology, political philosophy, and so forth seems irreparable. Uh, to my knowledge, the last important philosopher who could be called an important philosopher in politics as well as science uh, was Hegel who, uh, of course, wrote the philosophy of right, which, whatever you think of it, is enormously influential work, but also, in the science of logic, had an appendix on the calculus, which was enormously important in establishing the idea of the limit and launching the mathematical revolution of the 19th century, and is viewed very well by uh, historians of mathematics. I can't think of anyone in philosophy who comprehends that, uh, and no one in our field, like Angelo, who has that breadth. Now, in the late 1970s, Senator Malcolm Wallop uh, and his principal aide, Angelo Cotavilla, conducted a campaign which was, by the way, well documented in the Washington Post at the time. Cotavilla wrote numerous uh, articles for Commentary Magazine and other sources about the technical possibility of SDI. The idea that you could defend the American homeland against uh, Soviet ballistic missiles was viewed as fantasy by the, by the majority 
of uh, the scientific establishment. There was a seminar in 1982. Uh, I wasn't there, but uh, I, I heard accurate reports of it, where the president's, President Reagan's science advisor said, well, we're talking about strategic defense, but we all know this is purely theoretical, long-term, has no practical importance. And Edward Teller, who walked with a cane, a very heavy one, took his cane with both hands, smashed the desk, and said, I will not sit here and listen to this treason. <laughs> and everyone sheepishly filed out of the room. And it was because Teller, who was one of the great scientists of our time, had a personal relationship with Ronald Reagan, going back to his governorship of California, that Reagan went for the SDI with the support of a few visionaries, tiny handful of people like Angelo. Now, how did we win the Cold War? In fact, in 1973, the Russians were ahead of us in military technology. Remember, in the Arab-Israeli War, uh, Russian surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft artillery shot down nearly 100 American airframes flown by Israeli pilots. And the Russians thought, we're going to win a conventional war. Uh, the Rand Corporation and everyone else calculated, gee, you know, that means uh, if we have a conventional war with the Russians, our Air Force lasts exactly 11 days, then the Russians rule the skies. Between 1983 and 1982, in response to that, we invented modern avionics, which meant uh, inventing new computer chips, uh, new kinds of radar, look-down radar, among other things, uh, totally transformed warfare, smart weapons. So by 1982, when the Israelis engaged the Syrian Air Force over the Beqa Valley, uh, it was this time that American airframes shot down 100 Russian airframes. And that was the first signal to the Russian military that they were likely to lose a conventional war and they didn't want to fight a nuclear war. And then when Reagan announced SDI, and I, I know this from the public record, what the Russians have released from the archives, the Russians were clear that they could not keep up with the United States technologically and that convinced them to start backing down. That was the beginning of the end of communism. Uh, this, this was a very minority view. There was some concern in the Reagan administration that we couldn't afford strategic defense initiative. Uh, in 1983, I wrote a memo for National Security Council arguing that dual-use technologies, that is the civilian applications of SDI, would more than pay for it. It was basically a knockoff of a famous mem memo done by Chase Econometrics making the same argument about the NASA program. Uh, but the administration bought the argument, and that was, uh, that was history. Without Angelo and a handful of other people, we well might have lost the Cold War. We've survived by the skin of our teeth. So where do we find universal minds like this? What does it mean practically? Well, right now, we have a very similar situation with China. We have a more sophisticated, in many ways, opponent, certainly a much larger one. Uh, we know that uh, Chinese uh, missiles guided by satellites can sink pretty much any surface ship we have in the region. We're outgunned on China's coast. It's taken a very long time for the professional military to begin to admit this. Last November 29th, the Pentagon issued a report which uh, more or less uh, spells this out. Uh, last uh, September, I debated uh, Elbridge Colby on the point, and I took him to task for not discussing the implications of satellite-guided ballistic missiles, not to mention hypersonic missiles. We may be in the same situation that the battleship lobby found itself in in 1940 with the advent of torpedo bombers and dive bombers. And it wasn't until the Japanese attack in Pearl Harbor, the sinking of the repulse of the Prince of Wales near Singapore, the sinking of the Bismarck, the British attack on the Italian fleet at Toronto, that we decided we're never going to build battleships again, and we started building aircraft carriers. And now aircraft carriers are a vulnerable weapons technology. 
The North Koreans have ballistic missiles that can hit the United States, let alone the Chinese, not to mention the Russians. The Russians have a hypersonic missile launched by a submarine called the Zircon, which has been tested. We've seen the test. It's not a bluff. Uh, they could have a submarine lurking 100 miles from our shore and hit Washington with a ballistic missile in about a minute and a half. The fact, Angelo was passionate and livid about the fact that SDI had been abandoned as part of the peace dividend, that we had given up the technologies which in the 1980s were supposed to bring us strategic defense by the mid-1990s, 30 years later, we still have nothing. And our foreign policy ultimately is a function of our strength, and our strength is a function of our military technology. And we have a political class that's operating in the you know, most appalling ignorance of these issues. One of the founding fathers of the semiconductor industry of the United States told me, our government is run by idiots who have no idea how the industry works. Uh, the uh, techno-utopians from Silicon Valley have advised the Biden administration that they can suppress China by cutting off more advanced chip technology. The Wall Street Journal yesterday had you know, quite a good piece showing how the Chinese were using clever algorithms and arrays of older chips and workarounds to get essentially the same effect. Well, back under Jack Kennedy, when we did the moonshot, 12% of our total federal budget was R&D. It's now 2%. Under Reagan, it was not quite at the moonshot levels, but it was a huge multiple of what it is now. So the enormous effort that the young Angela Cota Villa achieved with a tiny number of other collaborators and his friendship and collaboration with Edward Teller has gone down the drain. And I think the best way we can honor Angelo is to continue his work and do again what he did. We're not very well prepared to do it, but if we don't, we might be looking excrement off Chinese boots for the next 100 years, which is not a prospect that I relish. I have no doubt the United States has the capacity to snap back from the doldrums that the Biden administration has left us in, and sadly, to some extent, the Trump administration. Trump, whom I voted for twice and supported, uh, had a weak spot for technology. And so I'd like us to think not just about Angela, the political philosopher, but Angela, the physicist and the strategist, who saw strength and technology as the foundation of our foreign policy and succeeded so brilliantly. Let us succeed to honor him again. Thank you. Brian Kennedy. Good afternoon. That was excellent, David. Thank you, Brian. Hopefully much of what I have to say won't be, well, it will be similar to what to what you said, because I think we were both influenced by Angelo uh, in similar ways. This was the book, While Others Build, that Angelo wrote regarding the Strategic Defense Initiative, and uh, I think it really is one of the best books of its, of its type. Now, this is, this is a wonderful event. Thank you, Arthur, for chairing this panel. Thank you, Ryan Williams, for organizing this. This is the kind of event you couldn't invite Angelo to. Um, and the reason was he, uh, he was a lovely human being, and young or old, he, he was just a, a splendid person to be around if you were in a social gathering. If you were in a professional gathering, he was insufferable. <laughs> so you would have said something, he'd have shouted from the back of the room, you've got that all wrong, right? Hayward, you got it all wrong, right? Or, you know, you missed the point entirely. What have I been wasting all my, you know, time with you for? So I, I, at the Claremont Institute, got involved in missile defense back in the 90s. And so we knew Angelo, and I had read the book, I had read everything he had written about it, I had talked to him about it, 
and the Claremont Institute starts doing work on missile defense in a very serious way. And I was the one um, responsible for it, and I still sit on the independent working group on missile defense. And it was chaired at the time by a guy named Bill Van Cleve, who was a giant in the, in the uh, whole field of strategic defense. He was a negotiator on um, the ABM Treaty. He was a personal friend of Angelo Cotabillas. They were close, close personal friends. And so we start having these meetings of the Independent Working Group on Missile Defense. And I would say to Bill Van Cleve, you know, what time does Angelo get here? And he says, oh, Angelo's not coming. I go, well, wait, how come? He said, do you think we could really invite Angelo Cotavilla to this? There'd be like 20 people in the room, all experts on missile defense. And he said, the first time Jack over there said this or that, it'd be all over. Angelo would eat him for lunch, three people would, would leave in a huff, and we wouldn't get anything done. And I would retell this to Angelo, and he'd be like, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. That guy didn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and I once said something about Edward Teller to him, and he said, oh yeah, 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 great man. Didn't know what he was talking about either. <laughs> you know, he totally got this one little thing wrong. And he goes, we would brief this, these senators, and he would get this thing wrong, and I would correct him, and it would just go sideways. And so, you know, he knew himself, that unschmucking thing that, that Ryan, you know, it was, it was, it was a real problem in the, in the world of um, trying to persuade people, because ultimately that's what we're trying to do here, is uh, persuade people. But he was a great man, uh, and I thank my colleagues at the Claremont Institute for thinking about this. He would want to be honored by us, I think, as David said, following his recommendations and seeing if we couldn't do something with them, taking his criticisms and seeing if we couldn't turn them into actual policy. And I hope in whatever I have to say, I can do some justice to, to all that Angelo taught us. He believed first and foremost in common sense. That is the thing that ought to guide us. He didn't have a theory of international relations. He had common sense, and he tried to apply that common sense to all, the, to all the problems that he saw. Theories, he thought, theories of international relations, those are for academics who wanted to darken the path forward rather than to illuminate it. He believed, as we'll hear from Mike Waller, he believed that with the right set of facts, what we think of as intelligence, human beings, by their reason, could understand what to do on a going forward basis in that, first and foremost, the policies had to be good for the American people. They may be good for other peoples, too, around the world, such as our allies, but they first had to be good for the American people, because there's us, and we have to do what's good for us. In missile defense, for instance, that was good for us. Whatever we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, that was supposed to be good for us. And his criticisms of things like the war on terror were built mostly on the fact that a lot of what we were doing wasn't good for us. So let me, in my few minutes, touch on his strategic thinking on missile defense, building hopefully on what David had to say, and also to be a little bit more specific regarding communist China and what Angelo was thinking about that. So first, the book, While Others Build, it really was a defense of both Reagan and this idea that we could defend ourselves from Soviet strategic ballistic missiles. And he was really in this book describing all the specious arguments on the left for why missile defense wouldn't work and how they were embraced by mostly the Defense Department that didn't want to get it done. And that the people within the Defense Department wouldn't be honest with you know, the president or with senators or congressmen about why certain things should or should not be done. And so you had this combination in this book of really Soviet propaganda working through the scientific community and people within the defense establishment who were simply, as we, as we see today in so many ways, just, uh, just dishonest in their presentation, gaslighting Americans about how, how we you know, should or should not be defended. 
And as the title suggests, it was strategic common sense. Nations do things for a purpose, and Angela really was guided by this Aristotelian notion that everything was done for a purpose. So why do nations build militaries? For a purpose, to defend themselves, to wage war, to be able to deter an enemy from waging war on them. Again, common sense. And whereas at one point in history, people had crossbows and cannons, today they had artillery that could be launched from set places or by naval ships. And yes, there were these strategic ballistic missiles that could be launched from both land and from sea. And these things were strategic, right? We throw that word around too much, but these were strategic weapons. These were weapons that could be used to destroy a country, to render it unlivable, to render it ungovernable that the federal government might not be able, if this attack were successful, that we could not govern the United States, that we would lose control of the United States, our Constitution, and therefore our country. For Angelo, these were not abstractions. These missiles were produced for a purpose, and that was the purpose, to wage war. He saw in the, in the Soviet strategic buildup a real possibility that we would go to war with them. And we're all sophisticated now, and we know, okay, well, that was never going to happen. Really? That was never going to happen? It didn't happen, but it may have been because of people like Angelo that David highlighted, and others. Or maybe the Soviets believed that the time wasn't right, and that they didn't know what Reagan would do, or they didn't even know what George Bush would do. And so they didn't do it. But that didn't mean that we had somehow, absent missile defense, achieved a perfect defense. The Soviet Union was building an offense and a defense. Angelo thought we needed one just as good, if not better. It mattered how many missiles we had and how many missiles they had. It mattered how many interceptors or whether we could build a space-based missile defense. Angelo was very much an advocate of a space-based laser. These were things that, as a political scientist, as a scientist, as an American, Angelo just thought, as a citizen, ought to be done. Could you build such a defense to defend this country? At minimum, could you deter an attack? If we were going to remain a free people, Angelo thought we needed to have the technology in place to make sure that was re a reality. And as you know, despite Angelo's and President Reagan's best efforts, we don't today have a national missile defense system. We have a very rudimentary system based in Alaska and partly in California and some on Aegis cruisers. But it's a very rudimentary system. The Soviet Union or Russia today could attack us. The Chinese could attack us. We might be able to stop a few North Korean missiles. Anything launched from a ship, we're not going to stop. For Angelo, that kind of a building of missile defense was a real, it was the worst of all worlds, right? Because it was created to give the illusion that we were defended without really being defended. And people thought that, or Angelo thought especially, this was, this was the worst possible thing because we're now going to have to explain that this science project that is our missile defense is always going to get better, the defense industry would say. It'll get better incrementally year after year, and eventually we'll have this dynamite system. And to this day, we don't have one. We're not going to get one. And the defense industry unfortunately, uh, doesn't see any real benefit in building one. They're making billions off of wars in the Middle East and now Ukraine. And missile defense is actually a pretty low ticket item. So they don't see a whole lot of profit in it. So this military industrial complex we keep hearing about, uh, I believe there is one and I do believe it's corrupt, but it, uh, it's not in the business of making sure we're defended from our enemies who have 
ballistic missiles. In Angelo's last book, uh, America's Rise and Fall Among Nations, he talks about missile defense uh, in a pretty elegant way. He mentions the fact that much of what I said and much of what he argued in uh, While Others Build, but he also mentions the fact that the Trump administration very much wanted to do missile defense, um, and they very much wanted to build a space force to get it done. But even Trump couldn't get his arms wrapped around the defense establishment so that we got it done. And the minute Joe Biden and his administration come in, missile defense is, is dismissed as a joke. The Space Force is, it still exists, but it doesn't operate with any kind of seriousness. Now, I don't want to say that all this made Angelo cynical. I, you know, of all the things one could say about Angelo, he was not a cynical person about things. He, he thought it was part of the human condition that we would fail over and over again about this. And he saw that, you know, these people who are supposed to be the adults in the room, he, Angelo always thought, you know, these adults in the room that he was meeting all these years, they weren't so adult. Or if they were, they were pretty stupid. Because these facts seemed pretty plain to him. And so one almost wonders whether it wasn't that we were living in a kind of death cult where we knew the facts before us that the Russians and now the Chinese are building ballistic missiles aimed at American cities. And yet we do nothing. If everything is done for a purpose, and the purpose is our destruction, what is our purpose in leaving ourselves vulnerable? Some theorists say that it's you know, to create a kind of uh, stability, that if we're both going to live in what Churchill called the um, sturdy child of terror, the idea that we'd both be destroyed, then it would create a kind of stability. Angelo was completely uncertain about that. He thought, yes, we, we might not attack one another, but that doesn't mean that someday it might not happen. And that whatever may prevent the Russians and the Chinese today from attacking us, one, they may not want to attack us, which is an obvious point. They may not think they could adequately win if they attacked us. They may think we will attack them back and they would suffer too significant a loss. But in any case, we ought to build a ballistic missile defense to take this piece off the table. Communist China, he deals with in his last book. He's concerned about communist China. He thinks their strategists are worthy of the name. Ours are not. He said they put us in a position to where if we have to defend, in this case, Taiwan, that we're going to be in a very bad spot. Our Navy is going to be inadequate for dealing with that kind of a crisis. And that's a concern for him. He thinks we should turn Taiwan into a kind of fortress and protect it. But he doesn't say that that's going to be easy or whether that would even work. We don't have a... Mis and, and, and he would often say, this has been alluded to, we lack a a sense of seriousness. He would say, these are not serious people. These are not serious men and women. They don't seem to understand this. If we were serious about Taiwan, he says, we would build a national missile defense. Because why would you think about being able to defend Taiwan if you can't defend yourself? And that, that has to be a great concern. The Chinese, as David suggested, they have the Dongfeng-5 intercontinental ballistic missile. They have four Jin-class nuclear ballistic submarines. Each of them have 12 uh, Zhulong-2 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. These are the kind of things that Angelo you know, was fascinated by, that these are things that you have to deal with. This is a science project at its best. These are things that, that real people could figure out how to deal with and to stop. And I would say to David's point about Taiwan, imagine losing an aircraft carrier today. In the age of social media, imagine losing an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea. That would be devastating to the American psyche, to the American stock market. How many points is the stock market going down that day? And Angelo worried about all these things. Just losing is not really an option. And so he speculates that because of this, 
we're going to be restrained in how we defend Taiwan or how we defend ourselves. You notice in, in the last unpleasantness with uh, President Trump, January 6th and all that stuff, prior to that, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Milley, was calling up his Chinese counterparts to, to, to reassure them that, hey, this crazy man gets out of hand. Make sure, you know, we just want you to know we're on top of it. He calls them up, tells them that. You might think that we're not serious people. Um, I would, let me conclude with this. I discussed recently a speech by a Chinese general, Shi Hao Xin, from the early 2000s, where he discussed the inevitable war between communist China and the United States. And it's a very serious speech given to the Politburo, and not one very well publicized. Our intelligence community knows of this, but it's not been, it's not been widely um, presented in either academic or political circles. But he makes plain that the Chinese are not afraid of losing people. And he talks about, since war is inevitable, we ought to use bioweapons against them, and if they, after that attack, use nuclear weapons on us, we'll use nuclear weapons on them. We can always make more people. And he references this idea of Mao that maybe America is a paper tiger, that we won't use our nuclear weapons, that we're not serious, that we don't seem to be serious about our own defense. And as I say, our intelligence community, our military establishment knows this, and you would think in the face of that would be doing things as rapidly as possible to make sure we were defended both from bioweapons if that's possible, but at minimum by nuclear weapons, which Angelo argued is possible. I think Angelo would say also that um, communist China, even though they're great strategists, they're not 10 feet tall. They'll have their own problems. We have problems, they have problems. They're not 10 feet tall, and we, the American people, can still rally our countrymen to go do the right thing, elect politicians to do the right thing. And I think, as I say, he wasn't cynical about a whole bunch of things. He thought it was possible politically to still, to still uh, save this country. And I think he would say that, that it would be important to communicate to the Chinese now and to our own countrymen now that if the Chinese think that they're going to destroy America, we need to be sending the signal that that is not possible and that it will be very costly for them to try to take North America, come what may. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mike. Thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. Arthur, for hosting this, and all the panelists who said so much on the mind to think that Angelo would be calculating space-based missile defense at the same time he was fighting internal subversion at the human level, at our political DNA, all at the same time. What a remarkable man he really was. Uh, CIA Director Alan Dulles, he personally instructed that an inscription be carved in stone at the lobby of the headquarters at CIA that said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Imagine today's CIA quoting the Gospel of John, or any gospel for that matter, in a positive way. Um, today the CIA lobbies are festooned with slogans touting diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, running recruitment ads by uh, cisgendered, uh, intersectional, uh, admittedly mentally unstable um, Latinx types with the uh, Bolshevik fist on her shirt, uh, as recruitment tools for the agency. So you took, none of this was or would have been a surprise to Angelo because he saw it coming. To Angelo, D-E-I meant G-O-D. To him, what has happened at the CIA and the FBI 
and much of the rest of the intelligence community, came as no surprise. He called it out early. We've already heard much of this. He, but he had this remarkable track record going back to the 1970s a, as a 30-something-year-old staffer on the brand new Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. This is right after Frank Church is winding down his hearings and investigations. This is right after George H.W. Bush leaves as his 11-month stint as CIA director. Angelo emerges in the Senate, and senators were afraid of him. Senate staffers would wonder, is Angelo going to be here at the meeting? They were scared of him. Because he'd give you that look, and he'd look you right in the eye with that little half smile and not break eye contact with you until you either answered his question directly or ran away. His biggest crime was calling out the CIA not for being overly secretive, but for being untruthful. Truth was something that mattered to him more than any other policy matter. And if he didn't trust you, you were finished as far as he was concerned. He found, he had all the clearances to know that the CIA was untruthful even in its secretness. So, his work on the committee just after a couple of years got him on the presidential transition team with responsibility for the intelligence and the diplomatic portfolios, and he worked with Reagan's then campaign manager, the old OSS man, Bill Casey, and for the first couple of years at least, he got along fine with Casey, got along great with him. He was really Bill Casey's man on the Senate Intelligence Committee staff. His job was to oversee the CIA, but he was not the CIA's man. He was trying to help Bill Casey get control of this agency that was full of uh, people who wanted to keep their cult of secrecy and their bureaucratic self-interest. And in being such, so true to the truth, he ended up after a while not being Bill Casey's man. But what he did do, Bill Casey had him meet with President Reagan at the White House in ways that no Senate staffer could have done. What degree of confidence was that? And we know some of this through Senator Malcolm Wallop's wife, who's then wife right here, French Wallop. She's also the person responsible for so many things, but for getting him both of his heart transplants. And she saw a lot of this firsthand, and the frustration where Angelo was privy to secrets that his boss, the senator, was not privy to. This was how Angelo was able to muster all these forces with the knife battles we heard about, or at least the training for the knife battles. He really did it in, uh, hope, well, maybe not hopefully, but almost certainly a figurative way as a Senate staffer, because he was vicious in these battles. And he did it always for the right reasons. Now, he was never the CIA's man, because to him, the C and he was never in awe of anybody at the CIA. Oh, you can all do great things. You can do it as an OSS man parachuting into the, uh, uh, beyond the Rhine inside Germany to help the armies come in from Normandy up to Berlin. That's all great, but so is being a great horseback rider or a great theorist, or a great professor. You were great in what you did, and that's what made you great. But he was not in awe of the CIA, or the FBI, or the people who hid behind their top secret clearances, and all this other stuff. So you never really knew what they really did. He was never in awe of that. He viewed bureaucracies as bureaucracies. They would always change. You have to abolish them. OSS was shut down after World War II. CIA was created in its place. There's no reason to keep a bureaucracy if it's not doing its job right. And what he saw, the ultimate crime he committed on the Senate Intelligence Committee staff, because at the same time he was there, you had other people like uh, George Tenet on the staff who had wanted to become director of the CIA. 
And if you fight the bureaucracies that much, you won't become a contractor with fancy government contracts. You won't be part of the permanent state in any way. You won't be a, get that executive branch appointment that you really, really crave and all the wonderful acceptance that comes with it. He rejected all that. But the CIA, in his view, should not survive because the CIA was not doing its job. Its job was to inform the president and decision makers through collecting intelligence, through defending us against foreign spies and agents, which was counterintelligence, through executing covert operations on the president's directives, not on its own, and through analysis. It did all of those things pretty badly, for the most part, with certain exceptions that Casey ran personally with some trusted people. So, how he managed to insert himself, or how history, or God, or, or whoever managed to insert him in this executive or legislative branch position with an executive branch role was really a miracle, but he was doing it because it was right. It would not benefit him personally. It certainly harmed him in many ways, but he was the kind of guy who simply didn't care. Now, in 1991, he wrote a magnificent book, a blueprint for how to not just fix intelligence, how to think about intelligence and do it over called Informing Statecraft. He actually finished the manuscript in September of 1991, right after the putsch against Gorbachev, but right before the Soviet Union had collapsed. And uh, 10 years to the day after, well, 10 years to the month at least, after Osama bin Laden's terrorists hit the United States. And he wrote in there that the major elements of US intelligence will have to be rethought and rebuilt. Of course, there was no takers for this because he was upsetting too many special interests and, and, and bureaucratic privileges and, and sinecures and everything else. So his ideas were never rethought or rebuilt. He said they'd have to be by the year 2000. They were not. It wasn't until after the 9-11 attacks that FBI made a big hiring uh, spree and the CIA made a huge hiring spree and you had this centralization of the FBI and the conversion of the FBI from a law enforcement and investigative agency to a domestic intelligence agency with police powers. And the CIA also became what it became, not being a truth teller necessarily to the decision makers, often not. If you look at the weasel words in the, in the uh, briefs, always passive voice. Ever hear Angelo use the passive voice except sarcastically? <laughs> It's all passive voice. It's all this or that or maybe this. Very little conclusive, and intelligence a lot cannot be conclusive, but it was this wishy-washy tripe that, 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 that you'd never hear him speak about or say or tolerate even as a professor. The CIA had its old boy network to manage perceptions by leaking to the press, by authoring or helping others author their books, by serving as consultants to Hollywood to script how the CIA should look, by dominating uh, academic studies of intelligence and training the new uh, old boy networks, people who would play well with others. But Angelo had his own exceptional network. He, he played five-dimensional chess. He had a small but trusted loyalist network. He knew all about bureaucratic warfare and subversion, both as a scholar and as a practitioner. How our enemies were subverting us and how our security institutions were also subverting us. He knew exactly whom to call and when to call and what to say to them when they called. He was a, he was a talent spotter early on for Bill Casey when he was first trying to take hold of the CIA. And he would size people up, and he, he despised what he called dishonest treachery. Treachery was fine with him in the intelligence world, because you have to be treacherous. But to be a dishonest and treacherous was very, very different. And that's what he despised. That's, in fact, why a certain reviewer of his book it had to go through CIA pre-publication clearance, the manuscript did, and, the, and one of the old boy network reviewers said, we're not going to 
recruit people in the agency the way Cotabila wants us to do. And then he accused Angelo of breaking certain espionage laws that either didn't exist or were not the point because it had already gotten pre-publication review clearance from the CIA. But part of this dishonest treachery meant understanding Western civilization. From the classics, ancient Hebraic traditions, ancient Greek traditions, uh, Aristotelian traditions, all of this stuff that was so important because he could bring everything to Aristotle or Aquinas, any point in the world, he could say, well, what, would he, what would he say, what would he do? And so when he looked at treachery, he also looked at fundamentals. He was a fundamental person, whether it's fundamental in the classics, fundamental in the sciences. He was the only member of the Senate staff, probably the only American anywhere, who read and studied the intelligence community's entire annual budget, line item by line item. It was a pile of documents two feet thick. Nobody at the CIA read, theirs were even, the, even the CIA director's executives would only have a two or three inch pile. He read all of that stuff, and then he would do the most terrible thing. On the committee, he would go to the intelligence officials who were asking for that money, and he would say, in his words, I asked Aristotle's simple questions of officials throughout the intelligence community. What is the purpose of this activity? Stare, smile, what's the purpose? David can do it great, I, I, I can't even. He just did it this evening earlier. Um, why would you do this rather than do something else? Do you do this for the sake of that or vice versa? By what criteria do you judge your products, good or bad? Now, good or bad meant a whole lot to him in so many ways. His translation of Machiavelli's The Prince has been brought up earlier, but that was a big, big issue because Machiavelli turned good and bad on its head, where good was bad and bad was good. So Dante, in his great talents, uh, in Machiavelli's eyes, wasted all those talents because he did not advance his city, his state, his sovereign, or anything else. He was doing it for God and for the salvation of souls. What a waste. That had no practical use. In, in Machiavelli's terms. So, so, and, then, and then Angelo would pick apart at words. He'd look at the translations, and in one translation of Machiavelli, because we all have to read it in English, most of us, he, he could read it in the original, was... Don't, you have to learn to not be good. That was, he found the translation is really, you have to learn to not be good, which is a big difference. But the effects that Machiavelli had on Western political thought from that point onward, whether he was attributed or not, was remarkable. Especially when coming to what affects us now critical theory, cultural Marxism, the subversion that people like uh, the common turn agent Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Communist Party came up with in prison, and how that infected our way of thinking, especially once that was translated into English in the 1960s. That in partnership with the Frankfurt School, that common turn operation from Germany that migrated over to Columbia University and spread like a pestilence throughout the Ivy League and California universities and gave us people like Herbert Marcuse and became the worldview of political science and international relations departments at universities across the country to educate our next generations of intelligence analysts and officers. Angelo saw all this. So he saw that the machinery created to defend our constitutional republic had been twisted to power for power's sake, whether it was for money, belief, ideology, or simply the way people had been educated. That's what it had become. So he called it in early in a, in, a, um, in a work on political warfare that he wrote in 2006. He noted that as dangerous as enemy spies are, to steal secrets. All they do is steal secrets. The real dangers are the agents of influence who come here to subvert our thinking. So Alger Hiss did far more damage as a Soviet agent of influence than he did as a mere spy. 
Harry Hopkins changed the world for Stalin, changed our, all of our lives, not as a spy, but as an agent of influence who lived with Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House. But even worse than the agents of influence were, what it, were their fellow travelers, according to Angelo, the useful idiots, the people who would parrot this stuff, develop their own theories about this stuff, write their own material, and then teach it, all based on what the Soviet agents or other agents had already written to implant in our society in the first place. This was the kind of stuff that Angelo knew fundamentally, understood fundamentally, and fought fundamentally. And finally, American intelligence and counterintelligence, as Angelo understood, they knew little of this. They didn't find many Soviet spies without help from our allies who found them for us or who mess things up by turning themselves in or exposing themselves. You never heard of us infiltrating the Kremlin or the Chinese Politburo. He understood this. So they don't perform the missions. Congress doesn't understand subversion, and they make the laws. The courts don't understand subversion. They interpret the laws. The intelligence services and the FBI do understand subversion, but in the wrong way. As Angela warned back in the 1980s, but would certainly be warning today, because they're directing that subversion at us. And so, his approach to intelligence in the 1970s and 80s led the foundations for his study and understanding of the ruling class. Thank you very much. Uh, we, have just, we have just a few minutes left for Q&A. Uh, David Goldman has to leave in five minutes, so uh, you should direct any questions you have uh, to him now, and then everybody else can, in the remaining five minutes, uh, ask questions of the rest of the panel. Questions? Ken. Aiden. Um, reading... Um Reading Angelo's last book uh, that he had written 10 years previously, I guess, um, he says it would be sheer stupidity for Russia to attack Ukraine. Um, so how do you think Angelo would uh, understand the Russian invasion? Uh, Angelo's view on Russia and Ukraine was that uh, some kind of partition was probably the right way to deal with it. You have Russian-speaking areas, which uh, were Russian until you know, quite recently, in fact. And the Donbass was probably uh, best left to, uh, to Russia. Um, yeah. This whole thing has been turned into such a ghastly mess by the US administration on so m in so many ways. I don't know how you would unbreak those eggs and how Angela would, uh, uh, would address that at this point. Yes, it was stupid of Putin to attack Ukraine, uh, but he's there, and it was also stupid of the U.S. administration to dare him to do it without checking how many 150 millimeter, 155 millimeter howitzer shells we had on hand, uh, or whether sanctions would have any effect on Russia. So this is a comedy of black comedy of ghastly blunders on all sides. Uh, we still don't know what's really going on because I think the uh, Biden administration really didn't know, and to the extent they knew, they lied to us continuously, as we know from some of the Defense Department leaks. So it's a classic Cote Villa example of intelligence agencies and government bureaucracies deluding themselves, deluding their masters, and ending up with a policy catastrophe. How we approach it now, I don't know. There's absolutely no possible good solution. Either we kick Putin out, uh, which we may not be able to, or we have to make a deal with him, which is also pretty awful. Best thing would be to kick him out, but we don't know if that's possible or not. So uh, Angelo's a lot smarter than I am. He'd probably have a solution I don't. Can I say this about that, though, Ken? Here in Washington, among, well, let's just call them conservatives, who were of a certain age and who were cold warriors, 
and who saw the existential threat of the Soviet Union. I, I get a you know weekly brief where you know there's you know ten folks on the call that are that would fall into that camp, and it is just shocking to me how many people just. It's Russia, it's the Soviet Union. Whatever we can do to kick them in the teeth, we have to kick them in the teeth. We don't care that the Biden administration is in charge. We got to go after them. That's target number one. And other people, kind of like me, think, can we just dislike everybody that's not us? Can we distrust the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Chinese? You know, I, I mean, we just, I don't trust the Biden administration, you know either, and I don't trust them to get this right. Angelo was never captured by that way of thinking. He would have thought anew about all these crises and would have tried to have dealt with them in its own unique way. He would have saw everything David just said. He would have also seen the Biden administration's failure to both understand and to act accordingly. Because if you could win through diplomacy, why not do that? Sure, Putin's a bad guy, but that doesn't mean we ought to be egging him on to invade Ukraine, as if just because he fulfills the dreams of you know the people who think he's the most evil, it's it's actually a virtue somehow. Uh, one more question. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Oh, well, just wait for the microphone to arrive. This guy is, is new to me. It, I grew up in this um, milieu. My dad, that was my father's career, but I had never heard this guy's name before. But I, I think some of the discussion, <clears throat> for me, seems to be missing the mark a little bit, particularly with current events in, in Ukraine, that the mess that it is, I think the people involved would say that that's a feature, not a bug. That that they're grifting off of the mess that it is. But the, the um, whole afternoon's event uh, ab about uh, Angelo, to me, is that, or what I got out of it, is that he was someone who had the ability to sort of see around the corner um, into the future. And so I'm wondering from... Any, any of you guys, what you think he would say if he were standing here now to see around the, the, the corner into the future from here, particularly, I think, with mainstream media that I think is, is one of the biggest foundations of the problems that we have. He would probably say, alas, because he was so philosophical about human failures and stupidity and shallowness and selfishness uh, that he had a way of saying, wrapping up his thoughts in one word like that. He would certainly have much more to say, but I think that would be his approach that, yeah, this stuff happens. Uh, we got to expect it. I think he would want to try to see the logic of the strategy that was being employed. I mean, one can look at Zelensky and think this is all just a grift, right? And this whole thing is a distraction from perhaps Taiwan, and that the Russians and the Chinese now have this unlimited strategic partnership, and whatever's going on in Ukraine may be just to distract from the Chinese attempt to deplete whatever resources we have vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Angela would have seen all those things. He would have, but he, he, he tried to talk at a level that avoided any labels of like a conspiracy theory. And it's easy to get into the conspiracy theory realm because the media itself in its own way with its own form of disinformation and gaslighting takes one kernel of truth and expands it into a, a narrative, as they say, in order to deceive. Angelo tried to talk about things that had a logic all their own. What was the purpose of going into Ukraine? What is the purpose of us defending X, Y, or Z? And, and I think in his writings, I'd recommend, we talked it sort of in the abstract, if you're not, or we talked 
about Angelo as if people sort of knew what it was he was talking about or what you might have read some of his things. I would encourage everyone, especially the people who watch this on, on, on video, to, um, to read his books. They're really well written. They're really smart. They're extremely readable. And I'll, I'll say I think he's better in print than he was in person in a way. Because he had, you know, they're, they're, they're substantial books, and they're a real education, and, and I recommend them to everyone. But he was good in person, too. Oh, he was a great human being. I just, you know, I, I'm just saying we're not going to see him in person. So the books are, are the best you have. Well, we are out of time. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you for attending. Please join us for a reception in the back. Thank you. Thank you.